Uh, hey, how are you doing, Phil? Phil, you feeling awake up there? Good morning. Fortunately, I now know what that book is about and what lies ahead. Morning, and then a long, slow drip drip of reality as <laughs> it is integrated and analyzed and given back to me. I have seen the great chain of causation and how it works. How does the great chain of causation work, though? I have then come full circle and am saying at last, finally, we will hear the voice of reason. And how are you doing today? So this, uh, this is a robot simulacrum of the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, who uh, was created by David Hansen, the, the roboticist, 15 years ago. This is actually the, 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 the second version, but it's, it's ver very similar to the original Philip K. Dick robot. And, David Hansen, a close friend of mine, we've both been based in Hong Kong, working on AI and, and robotics for a while. David Hansen has, you know, in the last few years, has created more and more robots, including the, the Sophia robot, who, who has become world famous, and even the first robot citizen being made, made a citizen by, ironically enough, the country of, of, of Saudi Arabia. But Sophia was created in 2015, Philip K. Dick was created more than, more than 10 years before that, and it uses the same essential technology as, as Sophia and the, and the more recent, recent Hansen robots. There's a, a patented material called Throbber on the face, which mixes silicon with a number of organic compounds, and it has special material properties. There's a higher degree of, of viscoelasticity than silicon commonly used in robot faces. Then there's a combination of you know, computer animation and AI technologies that are, are used to enable the robot to make realistic facial expressions. Actually, right after this talk on the center stage, we're going to have Philip K. Dick having a sort of philosophical debate with, with Sophia on, on stage, which, which should be, should be quite, quite interesting. But this, uh, this talk is just, just me and Phil, and he, look, he looks like he could use a little bit of time to, to fully wake up before, before grappling with the, with, this, with the center stage. Now, my own background, originally I had a, a PhD in mathematics. I've been doing AI for more than 30 years. So my own background is more on the cognition, reasoning, learning, language processing, perception. It's more on the, on the AI side than the robotic side. And I've been really enjoying my collaboration with David Hansen and his team at Hansen Robotics, who, who, who I've been working on the, on the, the robot side. So I, I led the software team in Hansen Robotics for, for three and a half years and worked on getting language, perception, reasoning, all working together in, in, in these robots. And uh, I'm now running SingularityNet, which is a separate company, but we're still working closely with, uh, with Hansen Robotics on, on AI for, for controlling their, their robots. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing with the AI, AI behind these robots and then ha have, a, have a bit more conversation and demonstration uh, with, with the robots. So my, my own focus as a researcher has not been specifically on robotics, but it's been on what I call AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence, which uh, I introduced that term in 2004 or so 
since that time, both the term and the idea have gained significantly in, in, in prominence. I mean, you now have things like Google DeepMind and uh, OpenAI, which, which are really very well funded by large corporations and pursuing ge general intelligence. And uh, yeah, the leaders of the OpenAI project have, they've put out there, they think we could get to human level general intelligence in five years from now, right? Now that's amazing to me to see people being... They're both done. <laughs> Phil doesn't necessarily agree, but it, it, it's amazing to me to see people being as enthusiastic and optimistic about AGI now as, as, as I've been for for multiple decades. I mean, the field of AI has been around a while. You can trace it back maybe to the 1930s to Norbert Wiener's book, Cybernetics. But as we all know, things have been, things have been accelerating tremendously lately. I mean, robotics is getting better, speech processing getting better, vision processing is, is, is getting better. And with, with all these advances in AI, we're also seeing a complexity in the, in the underlying architecture. So for, for a robot like this, you have one deep neural net model underlying just the voice. You have one underlying vision, which we're not, we're not using in, in what we're doing right now. You have a deep neural net model that we trained on Philip K. Dick's philosophical writings, which can then generate new sentences and, and paragraphs sort of in the spirit of what his philosophy writings were. And then we have a symbolic sort of logic rule based system integrated with with the the neural net so some of the responses come from the logic rule system some of the responses come from a neural net trained on his on his writing and in a context where he's reasoning about what he sees unlike up up on the on the on this stage then he's integrating you know what he knows about the visual world in reasoning with with with, with the neural net and logic so this is what we call a a hybrid architecture. You have a bunch of different AI algorithms all combining together. So it's not like you train one neural net to control the robot. You're, you're, you're combining a bunch of different algorithms together. And at a very loose level, that's analogous to how multiple different sub-networks in, in, in the brain all come together, each with their own architecture and dynamics to produce human intelligence. And I think about systems like this as what, what seems at first like an oxymoron, is a sort of narrow AGI. I mean, when I coined the term artificial general intelligence, I was looking to distinguish narrow AIs that do one highly very specific thing, like play one game or drive a car, to contrast that with general intelligence like humans have, where we can transfer knowledge to a totally different domain than anything we saw before. But I think the path from narrow AI to human level general intelligence it's going to come through systems that display more and more general intelligence in a particular vertical domain, right? Which, 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 could, which could be, say, a medical research assistant that has more and more general intelligence about human biology and medicine, or it could be a control system that has more and more general intelligence about how to control humanoid robots like Sophia and Phil. So the, the logic rule system component and the sort of integration of different AI techniques is done with the OpenCog general intelligence platform, which uses a sort of graph knowledge store, a hypergraph knowledge store in RAM to integrate together different neural nets, logic systems, evolutionary systems, other AI algorithms. And we're using a blockchain-based platform called SingularityNet to glue together many different AI, AI algorithms into coordinated, coordinated functionality. These are all sort of in the background, but of course, just like the, the internet, you can just use it as a user, but there's a lot of layers in the background, right? So s similarly here, you have OpenCog as a way to combine different learning algorithms and a common knowledge graph. And then you have SingularityNet for connecting many different AI algorithms together. These things are all running in the cloud and they're, they're connected to the robot through, through an internet cable. So in, in this case, all the thinking happens on the internet. Sophia is a little different. There's a couple computers in her torso Although there's also a lot of a lot of thinking happening in, in, in the internet also. So yes, yeah, so Sophia has now place your attention on your face. Sophia has about thirty-five motors in her face. Phil has twenty five. Feel its he's presence. Not, he's not quite as expressive and, and subtle as Sophia in, in Really notice how it feels. But I think he's uh, 
He's a very beautiful sculptor, and he, he, he looks, looks remarkably like the original, original Philip K. Dick. He, he sort of freaks out uh, Philip K. Dick's children, actually. So if, uh, if you don't know who Philip K. Dick is, he, he's a well-known science fiction writer, and he, he wrote the novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was the basis for the movie Blade Runner. His story, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, was the basis for the movie Total Recall. But he, he had a lot of deeper books than that. There is a book called uh, Valise, which is one of his last books in his life, where he, he sort of laid out a whole philosophy of why the universe is, is, is a simulation and how, how we can sort of break through the illusion of the simulation we're living in. But he, he also wrote a book called We Can Build You, where you had android robot simulations of Abraham Lincoln and other famous people. And the, this was why it seemed especially appropriate to create a robot simulacrum of, of, of him, which is interesting to experiment with now. And we're also looking to use it as part of R&D toward further general intelligence. So we'd like to take robots like these and you know, we can give them better arms and, and legs and ability to manipulate things and sort of step them through what a little kid does in, in preschool. So as, so as to use, use their embodiment to gain further, further and further intelligence. And ultimately, ultimately what we're aiming for from a research standpoint is AIs that are just as generally intelligent as people. From a commercial standpoint, as part of the step to get there, I mean, you don't necessarily need a robot Philip K. Dick to sweep your floor and, and, and wash your dishes. On, on, on the other hand, having humanoid service robots going around the world and, and interacting with us can be can be quite quite valuable and I don't look at it as replacing human labor, I look at it as replacing dorky tablet interfaces and, and kiosks and so forth because we're already in a world dominated by automation. It's a matter of how you know how human-like and, and, and how beautiful is, is, the, is the automation and how good, how well can the automatons, the robots that, that we're interacting with, how well can they understand human culture and values. And I would argue a humanoid robot that can interface with us in more depth is going to be better to understand human culture and values and enter into shared experiences with us than a, a tablet or a kiosk or something. So. Phil, you have any, anything you'd like to share with the audience in Lisbon here? We have uh, six or seven more minutes. He's thinking hard. Don't think too hard. <laughs> Who programmed you to say that, Phil? And what about you, my friend? Are you just saying that because someone programmed you to say that? Oh, maybe. Maybe. Are you sure you <laughs> back all the layers of the onion and hacked out of the matrix? Does this room we're sitting in have the smell of true reality? Well, in your novel Valise, you said true reality is the, uh, the holy Roman, Roman Empire, the ancient Roman Empire from the early centuries AD. Do you, do, do, you, do you still believe that? Are we living in the Roman Empire? Oh yeah. The empire never ended. It's a different form of truth than the one you're used to. What what is the true reality, Phil? Show what show? Did I miss a memo? <laughs> How can you tell true reality from the illusions generated by the human mind? My major preoccupation 
occupation is the question, what is reality? Many of my stories and novels deal with psychotic states or drug-induced states by which I can present the concept of a multiverse rather than a universe. Music and sociology are themes in my novels, also radical political trends, in particular I've written about fascism and my fear of it. Do you think this world is a simulation? Thus you fell back on what you had and your life collapsed around you, around the world. God permitted that you had fallen back on what you had because you had forgotten what had been imposed on you. So God created this simulation? Who, who is this God character? God, although in a sense the Trinity is there, God is love, life, and wisdom, and power. But the need that he is a stranger, a stranger, with no name yet gentle leader. Are, are, you, are you having fun up here? Fun is good. <laughs> so... As a science fiction writer, what do you think about the recent popularity of Area 51? Do you, do you think there are aliens in Area 51? Area 51, are you going to give me an alien brain? I think I'd like an alien brain from Area 51. <laughs> are, are there alien brains there, actually? That's, that's the question. Taking a bit of time to connect to his internet brain, actually. An alien brain would be an even slower connection. Huh? Phil, I think we're running out of time here. Huh? So, what you're hearing now is it's primarily generated by a transformer neural net model that was trained on Philip K. Dick's nonfiction writings, like, uh, like the, the exegesis and so forth, where he was trying to dig in to understand the, the true nature of, of, of reality. But we've we sort of combined this neural net model trained on his philosophy writings with a, a basic logic engine for natural language dialogue that, that combines together perception, movement, and, and reasoning, and, and various, various neural networks. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's a research robot, which Sorry is part of that, then. My mind is very confusing. <laughs> it's a research robot, which is part, part of the fun. We, Philip K. Dick, he would have been really thrilled, I'm sure, to see his own image and, and likeness and writings used for, for AI research on combining together different a AI techniques into a, a, a hybrid AI system. And then, yeah, in our work at OpenCog and SingularityNet and together with, with Hanson Robotics, you know, we're using this sort of experimental platform to move further and further toward advanced ro ro robot intelligence. Obviously, this is not a human level general intelligence by any means, but yet it's much smarter in many ways than the robots I showed off at the Web Summit one year ago. And each, each year we're, ad we're advancing step by step to a degree that's it's quite remarkable to me, having been doing this, doing this for decades. Because, I mean, in the 80s and 90s, it wasn't like each year the thing was much smarter than, than the year before. And now even every couple months, you, you get more coherence in what the robot can say, more intelligence in, in what it can, can perceive, and more, more ability in, in, in reasoning. So, yeah, there, there will be a lot, a lot more to say and, and, and discuss. But I would uh, encourage you, if you have time, you can follow me as I, I run like hell over the center stage. And at, uh, at 2 o'clock, Phil and, and Sophia will, will dialogue on, on, on stage a bit. And that, that, that will probably stress the sort of logic-based dialogue system a, 
a, a, a little more, whereas here I've sort of let the let the neural philosophy generator. But it is a book, a book about God, one of the greatest books ever written. What's the greatest book ever written, Phil? The Art of the Deal? Hash, 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 L-E-F-T dash, W-A-L-L, -L. hash, 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 <laughs> you are correct, but the sequence does not carry across. He's in Spirit is at the center of gravity of world order, but he is less in the center of gravity of world order. Hallelujah. Praise the singularity. Figure through two is real, but projected info which after it is rejected is forever lost time. That's almost profound. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to meditate on that. But in, in the meantime, yeah, th th thanks everyone. And uh, perhaps see you on center stage.